Hello and welcome to our online Wednesday Bible study. I hope you are doing well, keeping safe, and always trusting God is in control and you are loved. We are so glad for this opportunity we have to come together, even though it is not uh, in the same place, but we can at least be in touch through this online Bible study. I hope you have enjoy so far and I know that today teaching will be a blessing too. So I don't want to take more of your time. I want to invite you to go to the Bible study, but first let us pray. God our Father, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all your blessing, for your faithfulness that greet us every morning with new day, with a new life. Thank you very much for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. We ask your blessing as we will study your word at this moment. Uh, I, we ask you that you help us to understand what you want us to say through this Bible study. We ask your blessing. Continue to take care of our family, of our friends, of our church family. Be with all who need and we trust that all are going well. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, I want to encourage you, if you have a need, please let us know. Call in for the, to the church office, leave a message, and we will do our best to help you, and we will call you back. So now let us go to the Bible teaching. Have you ever had your view on something changed? I used to be adamant that I would never be romantically attached to an American. I thought Americans were awful. But I've now been married to my wonderful American wife for six years. My view, my perspective changed. I live just outside of London. And occasionally I travel up here to the centre of the city for various meetings. Now, if this was my only perspective on what London as a city was like, then my understanding would be really limited. I would only see skyscrapers and busy train stations and cars and people everywhere. But if I were to take a step back and remember that there is more to London than just that one place, if I were to remember the whole of London, well, only then could I fully appreciate what it is truly like, how it is a vast and interesting and often beautiful city. Over the course of this little Old Testament book, Habakkuk's attitude towards God changes dramatically. At the beginning, he was complaining to God about how he did nothing about all the wickedness in the world. But now as we get to the end of the book, we're going to see that Habakkuk had been given a whole new perspective on God. And so he stops complaining and starts praising and trusting instead. God had not changed. It wasn't that God had heard Habakkuk's appeals and thought, huh, you know what Habakkuk, you're right. I've messed up a little bit with all the evil in the world business, haven't I? And nor do Habakkuk's circumstances seem to have changed either. God's people were still sinning, the nations of the earth were still ignorant of God, and the wicked still seemed to be able to do whatever they wanted and get away with it. No, it was Habakkuk who changed. God had caused Habakkuk to remember who he is, and this restored his faith in him. We're in chapter 3. Let's start by looking at verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. For the first time in this book, Habakkuk prays to God, actually his singing, instead of demanding answers. That's a very different attitude to where we started. Habakkuk was once miserable and dissatisfied, but he was now able to praise God in prayer, rejoicing him and full of joy, we see when we get to verse 18. But how? Well, 
we start to find the answers in verse 2. Let me read it. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. In that one verse, Habakkuk sets out the agenda for the whole chapter. He had seen God's glory in the past. I have heard of your fame. And he had seen God's work in the past. I stand in awe of your deeds. And by the end of the chapter and the end of the book, he displayed a renewed faith in God that he could trust in God, both in the present and in the future, because God would always be that God. So let's look at the first bit of that, remembering God's character. Habakkuk had heard of God's fame, and in verses three to seven, he unpacks that for us as he recalled God's dealings with his people and his enemies in the past. And in particular, as he remembered God bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt. Have a look at the language Habakkuk used to describe God. In verse three, his glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth, the whole earth. That is a lot of praise. We are talking about a big God. In verse four, his splendor was like the sunrise. At daybreak on the 23rd of December, 2004, I was 17,000 feet above sea level, just below the peak of Mount Kenya. And I got to watch the sunrise. I got to watch as the light grew and it swept across the plain below us. It was beautiful. And I don't know if I'll ever see anything like that again, the vastness, the brilliance, the glory of that view. Habakkuk says that God's splendor is like the sunrise. He's saying that he knows that God is a big God, a God of brilliance and of power. And in the following verses, we see that he uses that power rightly to judge evil, and to give life to the righteous. That is why he is worthy of so much praise. And if I can put it simply, God's glorious character means that if you are on his side, if he has declared you righteous, as we saw in chapter two, then you have good reason to praise him. That glory and that might works for you. There is no need to fear him, rather you can rejoice that you are his. But God's powerful and glorious character also means that if you are not on God's side, you have good reason to fear him. In verses five, six and seven, we start to see what it feels like to encounter God's character as his enemy. Look at the words used to describe what it feels like. Trembling, distress, anguish. We are looking at a picture of what verse 2 calls God's wrath, his anger at evil. God is a glorious God, but it is terrifying if you stand against him. In fact, you cannot. For verse 6, he marches on forever. He is unstoppable. At this point, I want to pause for a second. Unlike Habakkuk, we don't just look back on God's past displays of his glory. We get to look back on the ultimate display of God's glory. We get to look back at the cross. In John's gospel, Jesus describes the day that he died on the cross as his hour of glory. We'll consider this a bit more in a minute, but Jesus is saying that the cross is the moment when his splendor shone the most brilliantly. 
Jesus' moment of glory wasn't when he controlled the weather or cast out demons or when he healed the sick or brought back his friend from the dead, as wonderful as those things were. His moment of glory was when he was killed in pain and humiliation on the cross. God's character is one of goodness and glory. And God's character is shown through what he does. Which brings us to our second big thing to remember. We've seen that we need to remember God's character. Well, the second thing we need to remember is this, God's work. Habakkuk put it this way. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. What deeds is he talking about? Well, look at verses 5 to 15. Habakkuk is singing about when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. God acted in history to show his wrath to those who did evil, but also to show mercy to those who were his. And the work that Habakkuk remembers God doing was a, a totally consistent outworking of his character. God is gloriously just. And so he will deal with evil. And God is gloriously merciful. And so he will save those he has made his own. Habakkuk starts in verse 5 by singing about the plagues that God sent upon Egypt. And then from verse 8, he sings about how God crushed the pursuing army with the waters of the Red Sea. It is a very violent scene. It's quite terrifying. Habakkuk looks back on God's work in history and he can see that God will not let wickedness go unpunished forever. Yet at the same time, he will save his people. Habakkuk looked back at God's works and in them saw the evidence of God's character and he saw a God he knew could be trusted. Do you ever look back at what God has done? You should do, because there you will be reminded of what God is like and what he will always be like. You can look back at things God has done in your own life, things he has taught you, circumstances he has given you, ways that he has grown you. You can look around your church and see the work he has done in the lives of other people, these things might not have been easy things, but God did them for our good. You can also look back at what Habakkuk looks back at. The Old Testament of the Bible is a brilliant record of the work of a God who deals with wickedness and preserves and protects his people. It's really encouraging. And best of all, the Old Testament anticipates and points us to the one thing we must look back at above all things, the cross. At the end of verse two, when Habakkuk said to God, in wrath, remember mercy, never do we see that more clearly than at the cross. Just like when back in Egypt, God's anger was poured out at sin and wickedness, and at the same time, his glorious mercy was shown. We look back at the cross at God's work and know that he is just because he judges sin, but also know that he has provided in Jesus a way for rebels, sinners, people with wickedness in their hearts like me and like you to live. In fact, if we trust in Jesus today, we look back at the cross and say, he has done it. He has crushed my sin. He has given me Jesus's righteousness. I am his. And if he has already poured out his anger for my sin on Jesus, then what do I have left to fear? I am safe in him. I can trust him. We must look back to the cross and keep pointing each other back to the cross. That's why Jesus gave us, for instance, the act of remembering the cross with bread and wine. 
so that we remember God's character and his work fully displayed there. Renewing our appreciation of God's character and remembering what he has done for us in the past will transform our perspective on God. And as a result, we will find that we trust him more. The last thing we see in this chapter is faith in God restored. Habakkuk finishes with these words in verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. The prospect of the invading Babylonians utterly frightened Habakkuk. And yet what does he say? I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come. That is the day when it is the Babylonians turn to face God's judgment at their wickedness. In chapter one, Habakkuk had been crying out to God at the thought of the Babylonians coming. But now, having remembered God's character and God's work, his faith in God had been restored. He would wait patiently for that which God had promised. But there is more. Look at verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfolds and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Habakkuk knew that trusting God wasn't going to be easy. A part of the invasion of the Babylonians would involve siege and starvation of the people. The thought of it makes Habakkuk tremble. His heart pounds, he is terrified of what lies ahead. Things are going to get tough. Disaster was about to come upon him and yet, Habakkuk would rejoice in the Lord. He would be joyful in God his saviour. Habakkuk didn't find this sort of confidence by looking to himself. No, he could only look to God. He looked to God, even at the height of his uncertainty and distress. He looked to God who does not change. The God who even in justice will remember mercy. What about us? As we look ahead to the day that God has appointed to judge the living and the dead, what confidence do we have that we will live? Where is our hope found? For the Christian, even when our faith is at its weakest, we look to God. We remember his character displayed in Jesus. We remember his work of salvation through Christ on the cross and as we look to him and not ourselves, we are seeing the reason for our faith. The book of Habakkuk starts with the prophet in deep distress and it closes with him praising God. Habakkuk's circumstances hadn't changed and God hadn't changed either. Instead, God had changed Habakkuk. By bringing his questions to God, listening carefully to God's word, and remembering what God is like, Habakkuk's perspective had changed. Stepping back and remembering the big picture of who God is, rather than focusing in on the detail of his own particular situation, Habakkuk could see afresh what God was doing in the world, and so his faith in God had been restored. In the book of Habakkuk, we see that God is a God who is righteous, and just, holy, and in complete control of the good things and the bad things in the world. And yet he is full of mercy and love for those who trust in him. And that is great news for us if our faith is in Christ, but terrible news for us if we are not trusting and following Jesus. There is a day coming when God will judge the world for sin and that will be a terrifying day. 
and yet it will also be a day of great joy as he saves and rescues his people because their judgment has already fallen on Jesus. On that day, because of Jesus and his good news, all of God's people will be able to join with Habakkuk and declare as one voice, the sovereign Lord is my strength. I hope that God is our strength. I want to invite you to join us next Sunday at 10 a.m. at our online worship service. You are invited to join us. Be open to receive what God has for us. And again, if you need something, if you know of someone who has a need, please let us know by calling to the church office, leave a message, and we will call you back and we will do our best to help you. Have a great and a blessed week.